Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to be a very polarizing game as far as I can tell. Some of its old school design decisions that refuse to cater or coddle will certainly frustrate some. Others will find it refreshing to play a game that makes no apologies for what it is, and at the same time there will be plenty of those who will be frustrated at some of the clunkiness present such as with the inconsistent performance, the at times unreliable AI with the pawn system, and the quest design that sometimes feels intentionally bloated and convoluted. But I think if you can look past those rough edges, there is a real diamond in the rough here. It's just a matter of whether your tolerance is high enough for those clunky elements that might weigh other people down. As I said, this is a game that is unapologetic in what it is, and what it is is an epic adventure with memorable encounters, locations, and a very immersive gameplay loop it's easy to get lost in. You are likely to love it or hate it with very little room in between. I, for one, really enjoyed my time with Dragon's Dogma 2, and I've already begun a second playthrough to seek out more secrets, hidden encounters, of which there are many, and also to try a bunch of different vocations I didn't get the chance to try in my first run. But this is one of those games that is just not going to be for everybody, and that's okay. The goal of this review is to be as spoiler-free as possible, while also giving you a good idea of what Dragon's Dogma 2 actually is as a video game, what it does really well, and what it does poorly in the eyes of some. I'm going to try to be as objective as possible when describing these systems and explaining them to you, but at the end of the day, whether you like these systems or not is entirely personal. It, it is subjective. It's not an objective thing. If you don't like open-ended world design that doesn't hold your hand, akin to something like Elden Ring, you're not going to like this game at all. But if you really loved Elden Ring and you loved how open it was and how unguided it was, you are going to devour Dragon's Dogma 2. No joke. In this video, we're going to discuss combat, the pawn system, the world design, the technical performance, and wrap it all up with a conclusion. And of course, each of these sections has been timestamped, so you can bounce around to whichever part of the video you find particularly intriguing. I will say at the outset that I tested this game on a top-of-the-line PC running a 4090, and I also tried it on a secondary PC with a 3070 in it, and the PlayStation 5. I also tried it on an ROG Ally handheld gaming PC, and I will discuss the performance on all of these in just a little bit. But I will say the results were not what I was expecting, even though I've been quite skeptical of the performance of this game in the lead up to its launch. With trailers that had all sorts of frame dips and pop in and things, I was pretty sure I knew how this game would run. And while I was sort of right about the performance, I wasn't right for the right reasons, it'll make sense, it's messy. Last thing I'll say before we just jump into it is make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed the video and would like more reviews like this or videos that I put up about twice a week. I am about to pass half a million subs here, so if you wanna be in the first half million, hop on board, because like 60% of you guys that watch these videos are not subscribed, so just press the button. I know you want to. You've been thinking about it. Just do it. It'll feel good. But okay, with all that, let's get into Dragon's Dogma 2. After you've designed your character, designed your pawn, and selected a vocation, you boot into the opening hours of Dragon's Dogma 2. The first five hours or so can be extremely daunting in this game. There are many, many mechanics, systems, and concepts to juggle in your mind all at once. I, for one, did not really connect with the first game, so I never finished it, and frankly, I didn't remember very much, if anything, from that game to bring in and inform my experience here, so it really felt like I was starting from scratch. And what I will say is that while it was overwhelming initially, they do a good job of slowly introducing new vocations, more difficult encounters, and other meta mechanics such as environmental puzzle solving and hunting for secrets. Initially, I was unsure of how the game was laid out, as they don't really hold your hand very much at all. The developers have made it very clear that you are supposed to wander around and get lost in this game, and they don't want to hold your hand through it, they want you to make your own fun and chart your own path. And I can confidently say after finishing the game that this is the best way to play it. Based on my notes and my recorded footage, I think you could probably get through the main story in as little as 20 to 25 hours if you really wanted to, maybe even faster if you're really good at the game. However, there are countless side quests and many, many, and I mean 
many secrets, encounters, boss fights, treasures, and puzzles, and many, many other things hidden around this world for you to find. And I don't mean the Ubisoft type of hidden where it's like an objective marker on the map and you can just walk over to it. And it's like, wow, you found the hidden thing that wasn't hidden at all. No, in this case, we're talking about actually hidden things where you have to be very perceptive of your environment, of statues and which way they're looking and pointing, and then assume, well, I bet the statue is built in this orientation for a reason. Maybe I should go where it's pointing or looking. And then you go over there and it leads you to another clue and another clue that leads you to a treasure trove of something really, really cool that I will not mention because it's a spoiler. There's so many cool secrets like that in this game. It makes me want to just keep playing it indefinitely because I never know what I'm going to find next. It's really, really cool. And after you find your first couple of secrets like this, you are probably going to be hooked and grow obsessive, looking through every nook and cranny, every cave and cliffside, every hill and valley, trying to find the next one. The last time I felt like this while exploring an open world was with Elden Ring a couple of years ago. And that really is high praise and just goes to show you how immersive it can be simply to let your players explore the world for themselves instead of holding their hand through it. There's other mechanics that make the game more difficult and immersive at the same time, reaffirming this idea that you should go and make your own fun without having your hand held, such as the fact that there's only one save file, a move that was made very intentionally to prevent save scumming according to the devs, or the fact that as you explore you grow exhausted and lose max health, or you get debilitating debuffs, encouraging you to find a campsite to rest at or an inn to reserve. Later you can purchase houses to stay in for free so you don't have to pay 2,000 gold every time you want to stay at an inn, which is a nice addition. But I will also let everyone know who's been asking on the subreddits and stuff uh, that there is no customization as far as I've seen for the houses and the places you can purchase as a domicile. So once you buy it, it just is what it is. There's no like Hogwarts legacy room of requirement customization or anything in here, okay? So don't get your hopes up. But having said all of that, this very feature for which I am an ardent advocate is likely going to turn off a lot of people at the same time. I have no doubt that there will be many players who just simply don't know what to do in the game and will get lost without a clue of what to do next. That is, of course, by design, as they want you to stop and think about the prompt for the quest, but I am certain there will be many players who just simply don't like everything being this open-ended. An example is that there's a quest in the game where somebody goes missing, and you are just tasked with finding them, and that's it. Many other games would give you an exact objective marker on the map of where to go, and then you find them there, and it's no big deal whatsoever. Just somehow the player character knew exactly where to go in order to find them, or they found a note that they left behind that precisely mentioned where they're going. In this game, it doesn't work like that. You actually are expected to pause and think, this character, based on my conversations with them, would go here most likely because they want to be close to this place and they mentioned knowing people in that place before, so I should go check there first. And because you thought through that process and paid attention to the dialogue and other things that were happening, you ended up solving that quest puzzle, basically, dynamically and organically without any guidance or hand-holding from the devs. It's a really cool moment when you connect those dots and figure it out yourself, but again, there's gonna be a lot of people that just simply don't like it. And I think that's okay if you are a player that likes a little bit more guidance, more handrails and things, that's okay. But I wanna be very clear that this is not a game that's going to give you those handrails. They do have a system built in with oracles where you can go to a big city and pay one of these NPCs to describe a vision of your quest, which is effectively like a little hint pointing you in the right direction if you ever get stuck. But the fact that they keep this little cheat tucked away in big cities show that they want you to use this as an absolute last resort, something you only do if you are so stuck that you can justify traveling all the way back to a big city in order to get a nudge in the right direction, something that can take as much as half an hour to an hour depending on where you are in the map and whether you have access to ox carts to ride back or fairy stones which are a rare item you can use to teleport back to certain specific locations on the map. Paired with this are many events in the main story and also in side quests where you are expected to pay very close attention where you might be told to keep an eye out for X type of character or somebody wearing this particular type of outfit. And if you don't pay enough attention while you're performing other activities, you could end up with some pretty significant consequences based on your lack of attentiveness. 
it's really cool again i'll be coy because i don't want to spoil anything but again this is not a game that's going to hold your hand they might give you a little information and then you're supposed to run with it and again some of you are hearing all of this described and are falling in love with the idea and are probably preloading the game right now but others are going to hear me describe all of this and simply say it's not for them and it sounds like more of a headache or chore to play this than it's worth and i don't think either player is wrong but I want to be very clear about this so you don't buy the game only to find all of this out for yourself and realize that you've wasted $70. Just be honest with yourself and ask if this is a game that you're going to be able to connect with. And speaking of connecting things, let's talk about connecting weapons to targets. Combat. <laughs> you know, okay. My segues aren't the cleanest, but I'm trying. There's a lot to discuss here. And since this isn't one of my major three hour critiques, I'm not going to go through each and every vocation, every potion or buff or every enemy type that you're going to encounter. But rather, I wanna give a broad overview of how this system works. There are a bunch of different vocations that you can choose to play with as yourself or to use for your pawn. These range in complexity from extremely simple to very, very difficult. They have different focuses and specializations. And there are some enemies against which certain weapons are particularly powerful or particularly weak. For example, I went through most of the game as a basic fighter running with a sword and shield. Nothing too complicated. I maxed out the vocation and things started to stagnate a bit as I didn't really have any new abilities to unlock and I figured out how I liked to play. So towards the end of my first run, I decided to shake it up and swap weapons to the double bladed spear, which is particularly powerful against dragons. The moment I did this, probably around 85% of the way through the story, it felt like a totally different game in a good way. All of a sudden, I had to totally relearn the combat system as I could no longer turtle up with my shield abilities, but rather I had to sprint into combat and try to stun lock enemies for extended periods of time. All the while, my pawns healed me and buffed me. And this was one of the cool secondary effects of changing my vocation, which is that it led me to reorganizing my entire party since now I was the melee powerhouse that was focused on aggression above all else. I dumped the behemoth that I'd been traveling with using a two-handed great hammer and replaced him with a sorceress who was able to do more long-ranged attacks and offer more support. In the same way, in my PlayStation 5 run, I designed my character as a thief, and that fast-paced play style also led me to reorganizing my party there with their loadouts and abilities matching mine in support variations. And this is where the game really excels and where I think there's a ton of replay potential. I think each vocation maybe has 15 to 20 hours of meat to it before it'll start to feel like you've seen everything it has to offer. But thankfully, it's extremely easy to switch vocations and try something else. I would just recommend not going into major story missions or anything shortly after changing vocations, as you might get to the point where you are just straight up stuck and can't progress as the boss encounter was designed around you having a high level vocation to use and all of the abilities and perks that can come with it. Paired with the variability of playstyle is the gear system. And while it's not on the level of something like Monster Hunter, it is robust enough to keep you engaged while you level up your vocations. By the time I had fully leveled up my fighter vocation build, I had a fully kitted out character with fantastic armor and a weapon and shield that gave tremendous buffs. And I had my own little routine of popping certain potions to buff myself before certain enemy encounters that were particularly difficult. Effectively, I had min-maxed my character before the end of the the game, which would normally be a big problem as that means the last act of the game is going to feel very stale as if you have nowhere to go. But in this case, I think the designers intended for you to swap vocations at least a couple of times during your playthrough. And so long as you are doing that, you will always have something new to learn and experience. But once again, that might be something you love or hate. You might be a player that played through something like Elden Ring and respect a couple of times, switching from a blood build to a faith build over to a straight magic build using nothing but Comet Azure. But if you're somebody that played the entire game with the same build you started with and didn't change it up at all, this might sound horrifying that you will run out of new things to try and experiment with after just a couple of dozen hours. So just understand that it seems the developers want you to shake it up, and when you do, you'll be pleasantly surprised at just how fresh the game can feel, even dozen of hours in. But as for the actual minutia of fighting, everything feels very tight. It feels very fair, and even with the craziest of systems running, such as climbing up and grappling the backs and appendages of giant beasts, I never felt that the game was treating me unfairly. I never had a death that I felt was undeserved, and every time I ran into a wall, I knew what I needed to do next to get past it. And some of these encounters are massive and on a crazy scale. Other fights you'll come across are much more straightforward, such as the gameplay drops and trailers we've seen against ogres and cyclopses. But these were always really fun, and especially once you get a good party and you 
get your groove down, you'll be amazed at just how easy some of these fights feel when you can remember just 10 or 20 hours before really struggling with that same beast. But with that said, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. As you explore the open world, you are going to be coming across what are called dynamic encounters, which are basically just fights that pop up as you are running along a road or through a field or something. And these are designed to keep things interesting while you explore, so it's not just 15 minutes of running, but rather it's two minutes of running and then a combat encounter and then a minute of running and then another combat encounter, so on and so forth. In my experience, these aren't paced very well. They are extremely densely packed in certain areas of the map. And in some cases, I timed as little as seven seconds between combat encounters when running through a small ravine. Initially, it's nice because you can fight these things for quick and easy XP and maybe some crafting materials, but after that, it just starts to get really tedious. And towards the end of my first run through, I was just getting annoyed at having to constantly chop through dozens and dozens of goblins and hobgoblins and wolves and harpies and stuff. So I just started running past them all. What you can do is you can command your party of pawns to wait for you in a certain location. And so what I would do is I would set them to wait and then I would run, sprint past every combat encounter, and then after I was past every combat encounter, I would hit left on the D-pad, which summons them to come to you. And because the game's system for pawns doesn't want you to ever lose one, they just warp to you if they're too far away. And so I was able to just bypass those annoying encounters by just not letting my pawns ever engage them and just running past everybody. And whenever you have something like that, where players get frustrated with an element of your game such that they want to avoid it and just run past it, I think something might have gone wrong. It's not a big deal as there is a way around it. Literally, you run around it. But I do just want to point out that if you are playing this and you start to feel like you're getting really annoyed with the constant encounters against the same enemies over and over and over again, it's not just you. Thankfully, in later game areas, including the pretty significant portion of the game that opens up about two thirds of the way through the story, a number of these encounters are replaced with encounters against ogres or griffins and chimeras, among other big beasts, which end up being far more fun and interesting. They still get repetitive, don't get me wrong, but at least they're different. And this is where I was most surprised with Dragon's Dogma 2. I didn't think I would get annoyed or bugged with the enemy variety and encounter variety, but after just a few dozen hours, I was already starting to feel like, okay, fighting another one of these. And the encounters against Cyclopses and Ogres or Griffins and stuff, they're cool and they're fun, but they're not on the same level of something like a Monster Hunter where it's like an hour fight. It's multiple phases, they go back to their nest and you have to prepare all of this stuff to fight them. It's not like that. It might take you five to 10 minutes to cut through all of their health bars and that's fine. You know, they don't want you to get tied up for too long, but it also means that you can pump through a lot of these in a single run of the game and it can get really repetitive. For the first dozen hours or so of the game, I was giddy every time I would come across a Minotaur or a Cyclops or an Ogre to fight. And while I still have fun fighting them now with an end game character or with a fresh save file with a different vocation, I've been there and done that. I've seen these fights time and time again and they start to get a little old after a while. So that repetitiveness is something that you are likely going to experience as well. Thankfully, the game doesn't overstay its welcome too much. And frankly, because the story is pretty much a straight shot after a certain point, you have a good idea of when the story is about to end and you can get right up to that point and then go do other stuff. And once you start to feel like the game's getting too repetitive, you can just head off and finish the story and, and wrap it all up at that point. So it doesn't overstay its welcome, thankfully, because if it were stretching the story out too much, I, I could see it getting really, really old really quickly. But where the combat really excels and the game is at its absolute best are in these emergent moments that can happen while you're exploring and engaging in big fights. At one point, I was running around, headed to a nearby town to deliver a letter for a patron of mine. A really simple quest, nothing too special. Along the way, I came across a Cyclops, kitted up in fancy armor, including a face guard meant to protect its eye, and it was attacking an adventurer 
immature, inexpensive looking armor. So I decided to stop and help as this could potentially be a high level pawn that would be useful to add to the party. So your standard boss fight ensued with my party trying to take it on and over the next five minutes or so we fought the character and I was consistently impressed with just how dynamic the fight was. At one point I thought to myself, I bet I could climb up onto his face and chop at the chain holding his face mask to break it. And sure enough, it worked. And then I thought if I get the chance to stab his eye, it will be worth all the more damage. So I did just that. I climbed up him, grappled around his face, and tried stabbing him in the eye. And sure enough, it led to a stagger that knocked the Cyclops onto the ground, at which point I climbed on top of his stunned body and drove my sword into his singular eye, wiping his health bar completely. It was a really cool moment that I don't get to experience very often in these games, and it actually immediately reminded me of the Cyclops fight in the opening of the Blood and Wine expansion for The Witcher 3. In that case though, he's wearing a big bucket for a helmet with a small crack in it to see through, and if you happen to shoot your crossbow perfectly into that slot, you actually one-shot this opening boss encounter for the DLC. And I felt exactly the same way here, and it was really cool. And there are many examples of this in the game, such as one time I was fighting an ogre, and I was just chopping away at him, but we were on the side of this like sort of cliff face. And ogres have a move where they can leap towards you and try to smash you very, very quickly. So what I did is I had my whole party of pawns come and follow very closely to me. We stood on the edge of the cliff face waiting for him to come. And then when he started the animation to leap towards me, we all bolted and dashed out of the way. And then he just leapt off the cliff <laughs> and just dropped dead in the water below. It was super cool to see and it was something where I felt like I had come up with a solution that maybe the developers didn't intend or weren't aware of maybe it was even a bug maybe there was supposed to be like some break or invisible wall to catch him but there wasn't and I felt as though I had come up with a creative solution to that difficult problem of this ogre fight and there are many cases where you can think outside the box and come up with cool solutions like that. And I love it. One thing I also think is really cool is the pawn system. The pawns are basically NPCs that join you as party members. You get one pawn that is your creation that can be sent off to complete quests with other players and that you can customize the equipment on. You can also equip different abilities or select specific vocations. So it's sort of like a secondary character that an AI controls for you. And I was actually really impressed at how I felt as though I was building actual relationships with these pawns. I could tell this was the case because there were multiple occasions where I was approached by a new pawn while I was out exploring, which happens pretty regularly, and this new pawn was better by pretty much every metric than the one I was using currently. Higher level, higher damage output, their vocation was more of what I was looking for for my current loadout and skills at the time, and I knew that I needed to drop a member of my party and replace them with this new pawn I was going to recruit. But I realized I was growing attached to some of these pawns when I actually felt kind of melancholy at the idea of parting ways with this NPC I had grown accustomed to traveling with over the course of roughly 10 in-game days. It's actually pretty cool how you can form these passive bonds with your pawns without direct dialogue or any sort of narrative component tugging at your heartstrings, but rather purely through gameplay. However, I will say there were a handful of times when these pawns drove me absolutely crazy. Like there's this point in the PS5 footage that I have where I had my party of pawns and I saw a chest. So I ran off, I jumped across like to this little island floating rock thing and I jumped over to the other side, grabbed the stuff in the chest and then I was gonna jump back across to continue on my way to the city I was traveling towards. But my pawns who very nicely tried to follow me over to the chest missed their jumps and just leapt into the water below, which immediately killed them and made it so I lost them as companions Full stop. Because how the game works is that if it's your custom designed pawn, you can go back and retrieve them at one of the little portals that you collect pawns at. So it's not the end of the world if you lose one of those. But if it's a pawn that you've recruited from say another player, you just don't get them back. You just have to go basically recruit a new one and, and you're just, you just lost them. 
Even though you didn't do anything, they were just stupid enough to think that they could make this jump they couldn't make. So they just leaped to their death and you didn't do anything. It was very, very frustrating and annoying. Thankfully, it doesn't happen a ton. For whatever reason, it happened a ton on the PS5 version of the game, but not on PC. Probably just coincidence, nothing like technical is going on. It was really weird though. I had it happen to four different pawns on PS5 in just a few hours. And in my entire run through on PC that I had completed before that, I only ever had that happen once with a pawn where they kind of got bumped off of a cliff face and I had to climb all the way down to revive them. So I don't know what that's about, but it's it's just weird and super annoying. And there are some cases where you can't really tell if something is working as intended, if it's a bug or if it's a feature. In this example, I was traveling to a nearby city riding on an ox cart. You can basically pay to ride one of these and it will make the trip for you. And so it effectively serves as fast travel. However, as you travel on these ox carts, there's a potential for you to be raided along the road by different enemy types. It could be an ogre, it could be a collection of hobgoblins or wolves or harpies. When this happens, you're pulled out of the fast travel screen and you have to fight off whatever entity is attacking you before hopping back on the ox cart to complete the rest of your journey. And this happened where we were raided and so I had to hop off the ox cart and we all started fighting them off. However, one of my new pawn recruits decided to try and help fight off some of these goblins by making a huge sweeping attack with his great sword. It did kill the goblin he was attacking, but it also just so happened to destroy the entire cart that we were riding on. Meaning that now we had to walk the rest of the way in the middle of the night, which is not when you typically want to be traveling through these dangerous passageways. Like it was cool that he could break the cart and you had to be careful when fighting these encounters not to break the cart. But it was also really freaking annoying because now I just like 15 minutes of my life had to be spent running to this location when I was expecting just to arrive there in a few seconds. So like bug or feature, I don't know, but it was still annoying. <laughs> But once again, this is one of those things that you're either going to love or hate. In some ways, I can respect it. Like, yeah, we broke the cart. Now we have to run on foot. I get it. It's a consequence. You know, I, I understand it. But it's also still just kind of frustrating. And it's one of those things that for some people, it's just going to be like, oh, that's interesting. Others, it's going to piss them off and they're going to like rage quit the game and never touch it again. Again, you might love it, you might hate it, but there's a lot of stuff like that in the game where these things can happen. There's another instance later in the game where there's a boss fight and you can use kind of this like ballista thing to shoot them down and the boss fight has been balanced assuming you're probably going to shoot them with this ballista to keep them from like flying around and getting away from you. However, you and your pawns can also break these ballistas if they happen to get bumped into or have a heavy attack performed on them. And I had a pawn that was trying to like blow a bunch of fire at the monster we were fighting, but was standing too close to the ballista. So as I'm preparing to fire it at this massive monster, he just blows the fire onto the ballista and it breaks and falls apart and I can't do that anymore. And it was also like, okay, I guess next time I can tell you to disperse further, I can do it like, so it's probably still my fault, but it's still just, kind of annoying, you know, and there's a lot of little things like that that can happen. These dynamic emergent gameplay systems have give and take. They're a double-edged sword. They can lead to really cool moments that impress you, and they can also lead to really frustrating moments that annoy you. But let's shift gears and talk about the open world. The world is huge, and there are a number of cities, different villages to be found, and also different ecosystems that are unlocked as you go through the story. These are decently varied and always pretty beautiful, and if I had to describe how they're designed, I would use the word meandering. This is not like Elden Ring in terms of open world design, in the same way where it's just open and you can kind of go wherever you want. This is sort of like a collection of spaghetti noodles tossed on a plate. And so there's a bunch of spindly little paths you can take all over the place. And then there's some places where they all kind of interweave into a city and just a big knot of noodles. I'm just hungry. I'm realizing that's why I'm using this analogy. So it's different. If Elden Ring is just like a big pizza where it's just open and you can kind of go wherever, this is a very complex interwoven set of pathways and roads and things for you to go and explore. 
And again, there's pros and cons to this. It means that it's much more handcrafted. Enemies are hand placed each and every step of the way. So each of those encounters that you have on the roads are intentional. But it also means that it doesn't really feel like you're exploring very often, especially after you've gone through an area once and you get the kind of fog of war cleared so you can see on the map where you are and what's around you. You'll start to realize that on the map there might be a big section that you thought was going to be like a big city or something when in reality it's just a forest and then there's a singular road going through and that's it. You can't go elsewhere in it. You can't go off the beaten path. It's just a road in a big forest and so it looks way more impressive on the map than it actually is the later desert section of the game is much better about this it's much more of a traditional open world section and uh, it's very open-ended with a lot of secrets to be found in it hint hint nudge nudge but i would be lying if i said that i wasn't a little underwhelmed in the first 10 or so hours with how the world was laid out. It's much less modern in its design as an open world. Whereas the later sections are more modern, the early sections definitely feel like a game from maybe like the PS4 generation or maybe even the PS3 generation in terms of how they're actually laid out. Now, one thing that's done pretty well are the big cities. These always feel pretty lived in, the layouts make sense, and they're always beautiful to boot. But this is where we get into the discussion of performance because it's in the cities where the game runs like hot dog water. As I mentioned at the top, I played this game primarily on my PC with a 4090 in it and on the PlayStation 5. After a lot of tinkering, I was able to get the game running pretty consistently around 100 FPS while relying on DLSS to upscale to 4K. It's not bad for a game that looks pretty good when exploring the world and fighting big monsters, especially when you consider there's all of the hair dynamics and physics involved with each of these creatures and particle effects galore if you have a bunch of wizards and magic users on your team. And I was expecting it was during those fights with monsters when the game's performance would begin to tank, but strangely enough, it doesn't. It actually holds pretty constant. Where the game struggles most is within these big cities, whenever a large number of humanoid NPCs are supposed to be present. Not only does the frame rate plummet almost immediately upon crossing the threshold of these cities, but in some cases it drops as low as the high 20s when you were previously around 100. You will also see NPCs popping in and slowly fading in, even when they are as close as 20 to 30 feet in front of you. It's really bizarre because it seems like this should be one of the easier things for the game to handle. But in my testing, the GPU utilization wasn't even maxed out in these sequences when the frame rate would plummet so much, which leads me to believe that this is probably a CPU bottleneck. In other words, there's something going on under the hood of the game where it's simulating all of these NPCs walking around the city doing their various activities, that's causing the engine just to slow to a crawl and it has to take care of simulating and processing all of that stuff on the CPU before it can use the GPU to render further frames. This was reaffirmed when I tested the game on other computers and also even on the ROG Ally in handheld mode. Almost regardless of the power behind the PC and whatever the average frame rate was, upon entering these cities, it would slow to the mid 20s to high 20s and immediately pick back up once we left the city grounds. This would make sense if the game had like a ton of simulation with NPCs or maybe differing motivations and daily activities and things, but it's not that robust a system. All of the NPCs are named. They do have routines that they go on. When they die, they get taken to the morgue and you can go there and use a wake stone to revive them. So there's a bunch of like cool systems interplaying with NPCs, their activities, their deaths and, and things like that but it doesn't feel like there's enough going on to justify performance dropping as much as 70% just because you stepped into a city. And that's what it was. On this computer, 100 frames outside, 30 maybe inside the city. Terrible. Like, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. Thankfully, there aren't a ton of encounters in the cities where combat is concerned, probably because they knew that performance was going to be an issue. However, there are occasionally instances where, for example, an ogre can break through the city guard and start attacking the NPCs within the city. And you have to help fight them off and make sure everything is okay. And normally these fights would be super, super cool. And thematically and in terms of the dynamics of the world, I think it's awesome to see enemies crossing the city boundaries and actually trying to break in and cause trouble. I think that's super cool. 
but it was always held back in its coolness factor because the performance in these sequences was always really, really poor and made the fights significantly harder since frames were dropping all over the place. But more than anything, the fact that I'm running into these issues with high-end PCs makes me very concerned if somebody with a more reasonable computer tries to play the game i'm worried you might run into similar things hopefully they'll patch all of this by the time the game launches and it won't be a problem at all and you'll be playing the game right now watching this review and like oh luke what are you talking about the game runs great in cities that's my hope but all through the review period whenever i would step foot into a city my frames would drop anywhere from 60 to 70 percent which is Crazy. Testing the game on PlayStation 5, it wasn't much better. There's been a lot of hullabaloo about the uncapped frame rate targeting, in the words of the game's director, about 30 frames. And the reason this is a problem is because uncapped frame rates vary greatly, or at least they can, meaning they can go anywhere from the high 30s all the way down to the mid 20s in the span of just a couple of moments, which is extremely jarring and can often lead to things like motion sickness, nausea, and other unpleasantries you frankly shouldn't have to deal with when playing a game that you paid $70 for. And when playing the console version of the game, you will immediately feel that inconsistency of frame rate. Sometimes it will feel like the game is chugging, other times it'll feel pretty smooth, but it's definitely all over the place. I will say though that the console version of the game seemed to have a much smaller, like standard deviation from its normal or average performance. So if like the PlayStation 5 is on average hitting 30 or 31 frames per second, it maybe has a max drawdown of like three or four frames. It'll drop down to 26, 25 or something, but usually it's pretty close to 30 and it's only ever dropping by like, you know, 10% or 15%. On PC, I had drops as much as 70% in frame rate, depending on where I was. So I guess you could say PC is the less consistent performer, but at the very least you get better overall performance, I think, on PC. But all told with all of this, it's just unfortunate that this is even a conversation because I think the game is pretty damn good. But unfortunately, we just have to sit around talking about this stuff instead of just talking about the cool stuff the game does. We have to bring up performance and frame drops and stuff because in 2024, for whatever reason, developers can't seem to make a consistently performant game. It's ridiculous. So with all of this said, I think performance is tolerable and the game is certainly playable on console and on PC, though it's far from optimal. Unfortunately, we're just at the point in the industry where playable is the new standard instead of exceptional. And I, for one, can't wait for the day when I can review a game and happily report that it's optimized like crazy and runs fantastically well. I guess on the one hand, you could say like, well, at least Dragon's Dogma 2 has nowhere to go but up as far as optimization is concerned. It can't really get worse, but I also think it's ridiculous that you're paying $70 or potentially more for a game that runs good enough. And I think that that's a little sad that that's where we are, uh, that that's the standard, but what are you gonna do? And all of this brings us to the conclusion. As I said at the top, I think Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to be a very polarizing game. Some people are going to absolutely love it and some people are just not gonna connect with it and find it painfully obtuse and obscure. But I personally have really enjoyed my time with it I'm happy to recommend it to people, especially if they enjoyed a game like Elden Ring, but I would definitely do your homework on your particular PC rig, or if you're playing it on console, look up some unedited gameplay of it running on your particular platform before deciding to get into it, because if you buy it on console, there's probably not returns if you don't like how it performs, and on PC, you might be able to get a good taste of it within the first couple of hours before the like return period expires through steam so i would just do your homework first to see if you can put up with the performance issues but if you can i think you're in for a real treat the game is not perfect there are problems with the pawn ai problems with enemy variety and encounter repetition parts of the game's open world feels really out of date while others feel like they're trailblazing and while the game looks beautiful at parts technical issues and inconsistent performance constantly holds it back it's a mixed bag for sure but there's a lot more good than bad here and i think if you enjoyed games like Elden Ring that don't hold your hand and let you just go and find your own fun, you're likely going to enjoy this as well. Is it a masterpiece? Not quite, but I am sure if they take some of the lessons they've learned here and can apply that to a Dragon's Dogma 3, I think we'd be in for an absolute treat. But thankfully, this game seems to be 
precisely what we were looking for, which is a big epic adventure fighting big monsters in crazy cinematic emergent moments. And while it doesn't do a lot else particularly amazingly well, it's a really good time and I can't wait to play more. That's gonna do it for me. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you're gonna be checking out Dragon's Dogma 2 in the comment section below. I'm interested to see if you guys are doing this or Rise of the Ronin. I'm recording this review before uh, the review embargo for Rise of the Ronin drops. So I don't know what the consensus is there. So I'm interested in seeing if you guys are down for that or not. And of course, like I said at the top, subscribe. Do me the favor, just subscribe. We're about to hit half a million. I'd love for you to be in the first half a million before we start working on the second half a million. So be an OG and join us on this crazy adventure that we call life. That was so cringy. <laughs> YouTuber Luke Stevens sees 500,000 subscribers disappear in a matter of hours after a cringy joke. Okay, everyone, I get it. Much love. Thank you for watching. I'm bad at outros and goodbyes. I'm just glad that you're here hanging out with me. I appreciate that gosh darn heck out of every single one of you that make my actual literal dreams a reality. I remember having a dream when I was a teenager that I would one day be a gaming YouTuber and do this for a living. And now I'm actually doing it for a living. Like, this is real. It's an actual dream come true, and it's because of you. So thank you. But with all that said, thank you for watching. I love you all desperately, and I'll see you in the next one. Hugs and kisses. Bye-bye.